Good morning, everybody. Okay, so you've just submitted homework number eight. Homework nine will do uh, be due a week from today. Uh, a little bit further out on the schedule, of course, we've got an exam two weeks from today. So that's Tuesday the 19th. So if you're going to be planning for studying and all that, uh, schedule some time for fluid mechanics. We're going to finish up talking about Chapter 5 today, uh, some additional applications of the continuity relationship, Q equals VA and its applications. Any questions on the announcements before we move into it? On the, the exam two weeks from now, uh, are we expected to have the same amount of questions as it was on exam one or a little bit more? The format will be roughly the same as the first test. Will there be concept questions on this one? Yeah, there will be concept questions. Yeah. But most of the points will come from problem solving. Okay. Um, so we've seen some reservoir problems, both in the homework and in previous in-class exercises, just to kind of get the mental juices flowing. Let's consider this reservoir, where we know the volumetric flow rate in, the volumetric flow rate out, and then um, it's telling us the uh, surface area of the reservoir at this certain instant in time. Now, why do you suppose that they would put that qualifier at a certain instant in time, the surface area of the reservoir is 10,360 hectares? It gets bigger as it goes up. Okay, good. So he said it gets bigger as it goes up. So um, what that means is that the inundation of surrounding <coughs> wetlands, uh, hopefully not surrounding like residential properties, but as the water level gets higher and higher, uh, the area of the surface of a reservoir is going to increase. And so what we, now is, what we know is that right now the area is 10,360 hectares. Uh, by the way, does anybody know what a hectare is? Sometimes we don't really have the SI units down like we should. A hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. So 100 meters by 100 meters and so it's 10,000 meters squared per hectare. Okay, so what we'd like to know is what's the rate of the rise. We can tell just by looking that there's more flow in than flow out. So that means that the surface area is going to be increasing. So calculate the velocity of the rise. Here it says Q rise. So Q rise is the, on a volumetric basis. Q, uh, v rise is when we've taken the area into account. So what we want to know is what's the speed at which the water level is increasing in terms of meters per hour? So the net accumulation in the reservoir is uh, 4,250 cubic meters per second. That's how much extra is accumulating. Boy, that's a lot of water um, in every second. So this is a big reservoir. And so what that means, the, uh, the velocity of the rise will be the, the uh, volumetric accumulation, which we're calling the Q rise, divided by the surface area. And so if we calculate the surface area in square meters, it's going to be 1 times 10 to the 8 square meters, and so this is a really large reservoir. Then we can calculate the velocity rise in meters per second, and then we need to convert that into meters per hour by multiplying by 3600. And so 0 0.148 meters per hour, that will be noticeable if you know you were going to stick uh, a marker into the soil and then come back an hour later, it definitely the water level would be noticeably higher. Uh, by the way, I'll renew my suggestion that it's a really good habit to be in to always include the units with your calculations. I think that um, you know when I see mistakes when I'm grading a quiz or grading an exam, 
A lot of times those mistakes would have been avoidable if someone had taken the extra effort to include the units along with the numbers because then you maybe would notice you know, if this V rise is just meters per second but you don't necessarily see that if you don't include the units maybe you would have forgotten to convert into meters per hour if you didn't include the units along with it. So I think it's a worthwhile investment to always, no matter how simple the problem, just put the units there on the paper along with the numbers as well. Okay, so continuity equation just basically tells us the rate of accumulation in a volumetric basis and we can convert that into a velocity. Um, when we have an orifice in a tank, you've seen the effect of that with a steady head. When we were in the lab last week, we were able to ensure that the head, which is driving the flow out of the orifice, remained steady because we had an overflow, um, an overflow pipe that we could adjust the height of it, and so we kind of had direct control of H. And um, we've previously gone over the derivation of the orifice equation and how that comes from Bernoulli's equation by looking at the difference in the elevation and the pressure of a jet. Remember that when a jet of water comes out of a tank or out of a pipe, then it takes on the same pressure as the air that surrounds it. And so the pressure of a jet is zero. So we've kind of previously looked at the velocity uh, coming from Bernoulli's equation and then this um, Reynolds transport theorem which tells us that inside the control volume there is a change in mass over time that can be accounted for by the difference between the mass flow rate in and the mass flow rate out. So here what we're looking at in this image there's only a mass flow rate out there's no mass flow rate in. So what we'd expect is that the change of mass in the control volume over time would be negative. You know, it's going to be decreasing over time. So what we could do is we could say that the volumetric flow rate at the jet, V1, would be the velocity of the water as it comes out of the orifice. A1 is the area of the orifice. And so that's the volumetric flow route is the same as the um, decrease in height over time multiplied by the area of the tank. So this right hand side of the equation is just the Q accumulation term and it's a negative accumulation because the liquid level is decreasing. So we're losing storage in the tank and the rate of storage if we think of this as a circular tank for instance for, uh, for instance uh, you know from a given diameter we could find the cross-sectional area of the tank and then the speed that the liquid level is decreasing would be the dH dt. So um, in some previous problems we've said like A1, oh boy, we've said A1 V1 equals A2 V2, which is basically just saying that the volumetric flow is conserved, that the water in and the water out um, can be accounted for by the change in accumulation. And so here, this is the flow out and this is the rate of mass that's, uh, volume that's leaving the tank. Okay, so if we combine the orifice equation for that jet velocity, so remember square root of 2GH is just Bernoulli's equation to find what's the velocity of the jet as a function of the height. So substitute that V1 into here, that's what we end up with, and then rearrange to solve in terms of the time it takes, because we're interested to know how long does it take for the liquid level to fall a certain height. If we start with H and there's no flow going in, we know that the velocity is going to be decreasing as the liquid level goes down. And we saw it during the lab, once you turn off the hydraulic bench, then the jet trajectory at first is, you know, the velocity is high and so the jet's streaming out pretty far, but as the liquid level got lower and lower, eventually you just end up with a, a trickle and the velocity isn't as high. And so there's a range of velocities. At first it's high and it's gradually decreasing. And so if we integrate the time, 
then we can find out how long it takes from initial height to fall to some new distance h. And so what this formula tells us is the drain time, essentially, when we have a tank of a certain cross-sectional area. So a sub t is the cross-sectional area of the tank. Uh, a1 is the area of the orifice. H1, excuse me, H0 would be the initial height <coughs> prior to any falling. And then um, H is the height after it has um, drained for time t. And so it's kind of the, uh, the final height. So just to get some practice le with this equation, let's say that we have a, a tank with a top diameter of 500 millimeters and then the orifice diameter is 15 centimeters. And the initial height prior to it draining at all is 2.5 meters. And what we want to know is how long does it take to fall 1.1 meters? Now, remember that these H's are measurements above the center of the orifice. And so our initial height will be 2.5 meters. And we're saying we want to find out how long it takes to fall 1.1 meters. And so this H, after it's drained a little bit, isn't going to be 1.1 meters. It's the height of the water above the orifice after it's drained 1.1 meters. So just to make it even more explicit, what we're saying is that initially our uh, height was 2.5. <coughs> And then when it drains to some new level, it drains 1.1 meters downward. But the, the new H, so H not is 2.5. H after it's drained some amount isn't the 1.1. The 1.1 is the fall distance that occurred. So part A, how long will it take to fall the first 1.1 meters? And then in part B, what you'll find out is that it takes much longer for it to fall an additional 1.1 meters because the velocity out is continually decreasing. And so it's a nonlinear relationship between the fall distance and how long it's taking. Okay, so we should get the area of the orifice, the area of the tank, and then uh, if we want to find out how long it takes to fall 1.1 meters, that means the starting point will be 2.5 uh, 2 meters, the finishing water level will be 1.4 meters above the orifice. So it's kind of like the beginning water depth and the finishing water depth. So how long it takes to fall is going to be two seconds. And you'll notice that the, uh, the units, um, if we have the meters and the meters canceling out, then what we're left with is meters to the one half power in the numerator and then down here in the denominator <coughs> We took the square root of g, and so that gives us meters to the one-half power in the uh, denominator, and the seconds go up to the numerator. So it does work out its dimensionally homogeneous equation. Two seconds is the fall time. Now, an additional 1.1 meters means it's going to be falling from the starting height of 1.4, and then the finishing height will be 0 0.3 meters. So for that one, we should get 3.19 seconds. So anybody else get 3.19 seconds? Good. For that second one? All right. So I, this afternoon, um, I have to think of some like devilishly difficult homework problems that use this. I, I think I got a good one in mind. So I'm trying my best to throw curveballs at you this semester. It's been a lot of work to write all the homework assignments um, it's just so much easier to use the textbook problems, but last year's group kind of spoiled that for you, so they copied too many. All right. <laughs> There's just a certain amount of copying a person can ignore, but mm, not that much. 
All right. We've looked at uh, continuity relationships before with nozzles specifically. And so I think we've seen a very similar problem to this um, where we were using a differential manometer to tell us the change in piezometric pressure between two points. And so remember, that's what a differential manometer does. It doesn't measure the change in pressure. It measures the change in piezometric pressure between two points. And so in this nozzle, the uh, diameter is contracting. The cross-sectional area at 1 is big. And the cross-sectional area at 2 is small. So the relationship between those is that the area at 1 is double the cross-sectional area at 2. And we know the velocity at 1, and since we have this A1, A2 relationship, that'll be, make it pretty easy to find the velocity of the gas at location 2. Uh, we know that these two taps are 3 meters apart, and we know the density of the fluid that's flowing through the nozzle, which is air, and we're assuming that it's constant, and then uh, we have the specific weight of the manometer fluid, but we don't know the deflection of the manometer. So here's Bernoulli's equation, which relates the change in velocity to the change in pressure that's going to occur. And it also has elevation change terms. Um, to find delta H, what I'd like you to do, just I think it's good practice, rearrange Bernoulli's equation in terms of a change in P sub Z. Remember that the definition of P sub Z, P sub Z is the pressure at some location plus the gamma times the Z at that location. And so if we say the P sub Z at location 1 would be the pressure at 1 plus gamma Z1. And then if we wanted to talk about a delta P sub Z, what that means is P sub Z1 minus P sub Z2. So rearrange to remind yourself from Bernoulli's equation so that we have P sub Z on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it's going to be in terms of changes in velocity. And then once you have rearranged Bernoulli's equation, you can put it on the left side of this manometer relationship. And manometer relationship comes from the uh, hydrostatic equation. And it relates change in piezometric pressure to a, a deflection in a differential manometer. So what we're solving for, the unknown here of delta H, is going to depend on the uh, change in velocities and the change in elevation between the two points. So it just starts with uh, rearranging Bernoulli's equation in terms of delta P sub Z. So we're given the uh, density of the air, the unit weight of the manometer liquid, the ratio of the areas, and so uh, we can calculate the unit weight of the air. We're going to need that in the manometer equation um, from continuity we get that the velocity at location 2 is double what it was at location 1. And so Bernoulli's equation rearranged in terms of P sub Z. So this is P sub Z1. Here's P sub Z2. Uh, then we can solve for the change in piezometric pressure just by uh, having on the left-hand side the pressure plus gamma Z1 minus P2 minus gamma Z2. So all of that is what we say that's all encapsulated in the change in piezometric pressure. Um, now I got a good question as I was walking around is like what density do you use in this Bernoulli's equation? And so if we go back to the sketch, you know, we've got two fluids. We've got the manometer liquid and then we have air that's flowing through. And so you know which density to use. Um, it depends on 
where you're applying Bernoulli's equation and where we're applying it between the center line of the nozzle at 1 and the center line at the nozzle at 2 and we're, the path between them is the path that the air is taking. And so we don't use the manometer density because it's not manometer fluid that's flowing through that nozzle, it's air. So that's how come we are using the air density there. So piezometric pressure 1435 newtons per meter squared and then we can substitute that into the manometer equation. Okay, so 0 0.0914 meters is what we should see for the deflection. What would the defe deflection be if there's zero air velocity going through? If, if the velocity, like if, if they stopped the gas flow, what would the deflection be? It would be zero. There would be no reason for this liquid level to be different if what's causing the change in pressure between 1 and 2 is predominantly the change in velocity. There's a slight change in pressure due to the elevation difference between the two points. But what this uh, differential manometer does is it only accounts for the change in pressure that's occurring due to the uh, velocity change. It's it's unaffected by the fact that there is uh, a change in pressure between 1 and 2 that's caused by the change in Z. So that's the uh, differential manometer's effect. Any questions about this example before we move on? Yeah? I kind of conceptual one if you can go back. To yeah, that. sure. Um, when the air is flowing through the nozzle like that, mm -hmm. is the manometer affected more by the pressure shoving at the top or the loss of pressure at the bottom drawing the fluid out? That's a chicken or the egg type question, right? So I, the way that I think about it is, all right, we know that the velocity is slow here, so the pressure is high. And um, the pressure decrease at 2 is caused by the velocity increasing and so it was accelerating in this section where the diameter is decreasing and so what's causing the pressure reduction is the increase in velocity so I think what we could say is like this side it's sucking the manometer liquid up because there's less pressure at two or I mean it's either being sucked up on the right or pushed down on the left but it's actually it's the same net effect it's just that there's more pressure on the left side of the differential manometer than there is on the right because of where it's connected into the tube can you go back on the answer again? Because mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay, so how did we get the unit weight of what's the? How do we get the unit weight of air? Multiply uh, the density of air by g. Oh, uh, by gravity. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I went to the just the conversion. Oh, right. Density. Yeah. So the definition of unit weight is density times g. Density of any fluid by the gravitational constant will give you the unit weight. Are there other questions about this one before we move on? Okay, so earlier this semester when we were talking about fluid properties, one of the fluid properties we discussed was vapor pressure. And we talked about how there's two different ways that you can boil water. One of the ways is by heating up the liquid and by doing that you're increasing the vapor pressure of the liquid and when it begins to boil is when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the vapor pressure of the atmosphere so that's one way to get the fluid to boil and then the other way to get a fluid to boil is by decreasing the pressure that surrounds it here's a uh, figure and also a table that shows the vapor pressure of water as a function of different temperatures and so in the previous slide that we were just looking at where it showed the coffee pot with boiling water. That was water that was 100 degrees Celsius, assuming that the uh, coffee pot was at sea level, where atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury or 101.3 kilopascals. Of course, we know that atmospheric pressure decreases as elevation goes up, and so a pot of coffee is going to boil at a lower temperature in Leadville, Colorado, than it will uh, as close to sea level as we are here in Huntington. So the general relationship that we talked about is that the vapor pressure increases when the temperature increases. 
Um, and so you can have a fluid boiling because it's at a high temperature, or you can have a fluid boiling, meaning going from the liquid into the vapor phase, when the pressure that surrounds that liquid is very low. So um, consider the case that we have a tank of water that has a pipe coming out of it, and water is flowing through that relatively large diameter pipe, um, and then the pipe is contracting in diameter. And so since the diameter is going down, what that means is that through this throat section of the pipe where there's a contracted diameter, the velocity is high. And in fact, the velocity is so high that it's causing a measurable dip in the pressure. And so what these different uh, dashed lines are indicating is different flow rates. And so this top dashed line is where the piezometric head would be if you had a relatively slow flow rate going through the pipe. And so if you had a, a relatively low flow rate, there's going to be a modest dip in pressure at the throat, but it's not going to be anything extreme. But if you increase the flow rate, then that means you're going to have a big velocity through this pipe and a really big velocity through the contracted throat. Uh, because remember that the velocity is going to be, uh, as the area is decreasing, the velocity is going up uh, quite a bit more. So um, what this figure is showing is that if we want to do a graph of hydraulic grade line, and you, you've done that in the lab uh, when we had the Venturi lab, you did a graph of energy grade line and hydraulic grade line. So these are a graph of the hydraulic grade line. What this is showing is that when the actual uh, graph of the HGL is below the location of the water, then what that means is that you have a, a negative pressure uh, relative to the gauge. It's not a negative absolute pressure. Uh, that doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a negative absolute pressure. But we have a negative gauge pressure. And um, we can convert that to an absolute pressure and if the absolute pressure at the throat decreases below the vapor pressure, and so for instance if we had such a high velocity going through that throat that the pressure of the surrounding liquid in absolute terms was less than 2300 pascals, then what can happen is that these little vapor bubbles are going to form. You know, it's not air, it's H2O, it's gaseous H2O. And this is showing how much vapor you'd see at a relatively maybe a medium flow rate and then as the flow rate increased even more you're going to have more vapor pockets um, but they only exist for a very short period of time they form when the pressure is low but then you notice that this pipe diameter is expanding again which means that the area is increasing the fluid velocity is slowing down and that means that the pressure is returning back to normal and so you notice how the pressure is rebounding as the diameter is expanding again. And so the effect of that increasing pressure is that these little vapor pockets that were formed in the fluid suddenly collapse. Um, they are, I don't know, they're just completely squashed by the pressure of the surrounding liquid. And uh, as that instantaneously collapses, it sends a very small shock wave through the through the water that can have a devastating effect on the material that the, uh, that the pipe is made out of. Um, let, before we do this calculation, let's look at some pictures of the cavitation that can occur. Um, this is showing a pump impeller, and you can see it's got lots of pits, and it looks like maybe rust or some sort of corrosion that was caused by um, maybe, uh, I don't know, a, a cathode reaction, but it, it's actually due to uh, cavitation. The, uh, the risky thing when you're using a pump is that you're sucking water from a reservoir and the pressure of the water in gauge terms here at the interface of the air and the liquid is zero. And so the pressure inside the suction side of the pipe is also going to be zero. But then as the water is going towards the pump, it's zero and now it's negative. And negative is okay in gauge terms but uh, it's getting closer and closer to the vapor pressure. And especially when the water gets inside the pump and is being accelerated by the veins of the impeller, then the pressure can go below the vapor pressure of the fluid and cause this pitting and damage 
to the pumps. And so um, let's go through and calculate in this contracted throat whether the system will experience cavitation. What we know about the water that's traveling through here is it's relatively warm water. And that makes it more prone to cavitation if the water is warm because the vapor pressure is high. And so that means that all you have to do is the pressure in this throat, if it falls between below 20,000 newtons per meter squared, and this is an absolute pressure, that's the vapor pressure in absolute terms, if the pressure of the fluid falls below the vapor pressure, then cavitation will occur. So use uh, Bernoulli's equation here to predict what will be the, uh, what will be the pressure at 2 and then compare that to the vapor pressure to determine if it will cavitate. <laughs> okay, so we've got the contracting pipe, which means the pressure is going to decrease. Since the velocity went up, the pressure is going to go down. And what we have, you'll notice that it's specifying this is the absolute pressure, which we're going to need to know the pressure at 2 in absolute terms in order to compare it to the vapor pressure. And so these are the fluid characteristics where water at 60 Celsius has a given unit weight, a given vapor pressure. And so we're trying to see is P2 in absolute terms, less than the vapor pressure of the fluid. So uh, the pressure is going to be lower, and if we rearrange Bernoulli's equation to solve for the P2 when the elevations are the same, because it's a horizontal pipe, then we get the uh, pressure at location 2 will be 15 1,332 pascals, and since that's less than the vapor pressure, then yes, the cavitation, those tiny little vapor pockets are going to form. So I don't think that you can write homework or examples or quizzes in too many steps. You know, paper is cheap, and mistakes are expensive. So spend the cheap thing and avoid the thing that's expensive. So you'll notice I, I do the substitutions and I write the units and then I even break it down. Okay, how many meters of head do we have due to the pressure at one? How many meters of energy are there due to the velocity head at one? How much energy is there in the velocity head at two? Because you can kind of see, like, where is the energy? That's the other thing is, you know, at one, some of the energy is in pressure, some of the energy is in velocity. So then at two, we know how much energy there is tied up in the velocity head, and then the balance must be in the pressure head, which what we're, that's what we're solving for is the pressure. So take the time to be really detailed and thorough, and if you just only do the calculations in your calculator, it's just so easy to forget to square a term or to divide by G when you meant to divide by gamma or whatever. It's harder to make mistakes when it's all there in front of you. Okay, um, one really famous example of the damage that cavitation can cause was back in the spring of 1983 there was, it was a really um, wet spring and it also got warm very suddenly simultaneously and, and why that was significant is that in the mountains upstream of Lake Powell it's mostly Utah and Colorado in those mountains um, the uh, the river the Colorado River is felt uh, is um, fed largely by snow melt and so if suddenly it gets really warm, then the snow is melting at a greater rate than it ordinarily would. And then the heavy precipitation adds additional flow on top of that snow melt base. And so there was so much water coming into Lake Powell that they had to open up uh, both of the spillways. They're basically releasing water as quickly as they could. Uh, otherwise, the possibility existed that water could over could flow over the top of the dam and it's not designed for that. 
So they're sending a lot of water down through these uh, spillways. And uh, the velocity was so high that you can kind of see in the cutaway view here that um, there was a big pocket of uh, scour that occurred in the rock. Um, basically, as the water was flowing through the, uh, the tunnel, um, it had such a high velocity that little vapor bubbles were forming. And uh, those vapor bubbles caused a, a scour of the concrete, and the concrete eroded to the point that it, it was totally flushed out, and it was scouring down through the rock. And so it caused quite a lot of damage. I mean, you can see how big a person is relative to the size of the scour, where that was solid rock um, prior to that big release of the high velocity. Um, and so what they did to prevent that in the future when they repaired it was they um, started to inject air uh, to surround um, the water. And so it's kind of like riding on a cushion of air rather than being in direct, concrete, in direct contact with the concrete. So it doesn't have quite the same risk of causing scour because the uh, water isn't in, in contact with the concrete anymore. All right, so that's all for today. Let's take one last look at these announcements. The homework assignment, I'll post that this afternoon. It's due a week from today. And I'll see you in class on Thursday, or if you're in the civil group, I'll see you in the lab this afternoon.